So hello, um, my name is Erica Chung and I'm the Assistant Director at Photo Relevance. Um, for those of you who are new to Photo Relevance and our programming, um, we are a contemporary fine art photography gallery based in Houston, Texas. Uh, recently, we just put on a show entitled Now You See Me, which included works by the two artists who are here with us today, Jennifer Ling Datchuk and Tomiko Jones. It's an honor to share in this Zoom land space with both of you um, and with our audience who we can't see, but we know is cheering on both of you. Um, for those watching, be sure to drop any questions you have in the Q&A box and we will get to them either as we go along or at the end. Um, this is the last of three talks we've been doing with the artists in the show um, and our previous ones are uploaded to our YouTube page and this one will be there too, should you wish to revisit it or share it in the future. Um, and so to begin, um, I'm going to reshare my screen. Um, <laughs> um, and I would like to maybe start off with some context um, with an overview of the show, Now You See Me. Um, and forgive me if you've heard my spiel before like 8 million times, um, because here it is again. Um, so the show, which actually came down last week, featured a total of six Asian American artists who I brought together in an effort to sort of begin visualizing all of the different complexities and nuances to be found in Asian America. As viewers, sort of these intricacies of these artists' narratives help us resist a monolithic interpretation of what being Asian American signifies, stretching the term beyond its everyday demographic meaning as American citizens of Asian descent and into a dynamic realm that builds on its activist roots. Uh, for those who don't know, the term Asian American was coined in 1968 by a group of students at UC Berkeley, many who were influenced by and stood with the Third World Liberation Front, the Black Power Movement, and the Anti-Vietnam War Movement. Before this moment, Asian Americans were either referred to as Oriental or as being from their country of ancestry. By giving themselves a name, one that distinctly marks their Americanness, Asian Americans were essentially creating a political identity for themselves. As the activist Chris Ijima said, the phrase became less a marker for what one was and more for what one believed. As such, Now You See Me is sort of premised upon the belief that Asian America is complicated, vast, and quite frankly, incomprehensible. <laughs> um, but this exhibition suggests that we might begin to understand it through the stories told by these artists and that the tales they weave are just as crucial to the American story as the ones normally ascribed to the canon. Jennifer and Tomiko, I brought the two of you together because both of your practices, though visually different, are united by a sharp attention to tactile material elements, as well as by a similar process of reaching back into tradition and blending it with your personal present day experiences. I have loved learning about your works and I'm sure that our audience is also eager to do so as well. Um, and so I'll maybe stop talking, <laughs> um, but I wanna hand it off first to Jennifer um, and I will post her written bio in the chat for you all to kind of peruse at your own leisure. Um, but I think I'll hand it off to Jennifer to introduce herself and her work first. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Erica. And um, I, it's such a pleasure to meet Tomiko through this um, Zoom land, but also it's um, thank you, Photo Revelance, for this opportunity. My name is Jennifer Ling Dachuk. I am a, primarily a ceramic artist and I live and work in San Antonio, Texas. I've called Texas home for probably the past um, 12 years now. I grew up on the East Coast. I never thought in a million years I'd live in Texas, but I've come to really love it and find that there's such a, a supportive community. Uh, I'm happy to share and talk about my works in the exhibition and how I kind of came to um, kind of, I've always struggled with the sense of identity that um, I told Erica this when I first, when she first approached me about including my work in this exhibition is that I often don't include it 
get included in shows about um, being Asian American because I grew up half or ha or or sometimes say both that um, it's the multiplication or division of my identity that um, I've grown up and constantly live with the question what are you and how I answer that depends on like what I'm wearing who I am what my makeup looks like what I'm eating and kind of who I am at the moment and so Growing up too, like my mother is from mainland China. She's categorized as brown Chinese, my father white. And here I grew up um, being labeled nearly yellow. And so as my parents couldn't understand how to navigate interracial marriage, they couldn't understand what it was like to grow up biracial either. Mm -hmm. And also to grow up as a daughter of an immigrant and try and understand what that means and what it means to be American. So I, um, I'm trained traditionally in ceramics. I love the material of porcelain. Porcelain was discovered in um, China about 2000 years ago and was worth more than the price of gold. How I approach uh, my porcelain works is that so much of how we talk about clay is in relation to the body. When we look at a pot, we talk about the foot, the lip, the shoulder, the neck. And so for me, I wanted to take this beauty of this pot, a blue and white decorated pot, pluck something from it and um, make these porcelain blue and white eyebrows to adorn my face. And that these eyebrows were inspired by looking at um, the Asian women in my family. At one point, they had all gotten tattooed eyebrows. Um, my the women in my family generally have just like few wisps of hair above their brow. And then they went from that, from having nothing to like Sharpie drawn um, eyebrows where they perpetually look surprised. I was on a research trip to Jindajin, the birthplace of porcelain, where I walked into a tattoo shop and it wasn't a tattoo shop for your body because at that time tattoos and still are, are considered taboo in China, but it was for tattoo makeup. And this is where I saw um, a sheet where I could pick eyebrow styles and shapes, how thick they were, how the high the arch went and how the tail would wrap around the temple were the names of Disney princesses. So I could pick Cinderella, Princess Jasmine, Sleeping Beauty, eyebrows. And this was like an aha moment in my practice where I came there to study blue and white patterns, blue and white being the most appropriated pattern throughout the world, that um, it's the cobalt, which we generally attribute to being um, a Chinese aesthetic, but because of the trade along the Silk Road, we learned that cobalt is not found in China but it's become so synonymous with Chinese pattern and decoration that um, the global migrations of blue and white have traveled um, from the East throughout the West. And here, these Disney princesses, these beauty standards of these eyebrows were um, from the West traveling to the East. So I saw these um, interesting stories and collisions happening with material, pop culture and beauty. And then these became in a way performance pieces I had plucked all my eyebrows off in a performance piece where um, I look into a mirror and one by one, I, I remove the hair above my, my eyes and I recite the this nursery rhyme, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. The, young, the game we are taught as young girls to um, destroy the beauty of a flower in hopes that that last petal plucked lands on my heart's intended desire. So in ways too, that was a metaphor for me to kind of break and shatter and um, destroy um, what I was taught as like my identity and role as like a young girl, a female, a woman, a woman of color and a Chinese woman. So these eyebrows went away were about like manufacturing identity of um, wearing that beauty of blue and white above my eyes. I also like started thinking more about this performance aspect of my practice and how I can get it to live on beyond like making an object. I think so much of like my training in like 3D and ceramics was you make something, put it through the process of like firing in the kiln, all the technical things, and then you like plop it on a pedestal. And for me, so much of the soul of the object was gone and thinking just how much of ceramics relates to the body. In these um, photographs like Basic Bitch and Money Honey, I am still working with the ideas of blue and white, of um, this, 
these like really popular aesthetics rooted in like Asian-ness. But everywhere I went or I've talked to people about like what I do, I would often get, oh, blue and white. My grandmother from Germany had um, blue and white pots. Um, everyone had a different sense of where blue and white comes from. And I think that also was really reflective of like not knowing the origins and history of things, but how much blue and white has been appropriated and adapted throughout the world. I thought about, um, I made these during a time where I was in the Netherlands for a residency. And at the time I was one of the very few Americans there. So at the dinner table, there was always like a debate or a heated conversation or just like a good conversation about American politics and systems. And I found myself getting really flustered and like trying to my, in a way for me to make sense of like a really convoluted, um, hard to understand system of American politics and trying to relay that to countries deeply rooted in socialism, um, which we were all on the same page. So in some ways I was like, I felt like every time at dinner I needed to do homework and I came ready to battle and just thinking about armor, but armor in a way where it felt like culturally new and relevant and um, a fashionable accessory. So I was looking at knuckle rings, um, that kind of proliferate like pop culture, hip hop culture, where they become um, these objects to insert like words or labels and um, adornment. So that's where basic bitch and money honey come, come into. That um, also how I wanted them to be displayed was I wanted these images to become something that could travel more. Just like how during the time at my residency, learning about the American election, like I was getting this information in real time and how much information travels and crisscrosses the world, the global migrations of that. So I, um, they're done in like emoji hands, like the peace sign or the raise the roof or like praise sign. And I knew I wanted to do my nails. I'm interested in nail culture as a form of craft as well as like someone who spends a lot of time on the handmade and decoration. I worked with a nail salon in San Antonio who um, it's Asian owned and I walked in and I said, give me blue and white nails. And she was like, oh, like the pottery. And I was like, yes. And I just let her do what she wanted. But she also had a sense of where blue and white came from, but also it was interesting to hear her say like, oh, square nails would be like what a basic girl would get. Basic being kind of the predictable, the, um, the what is deeply rooted in like American consumerism. It's what we think is culture and what we should all like, but it's really just basic, it's every day. And so I, I, part of my practice has to do a lot with research. I became deeply fascinated with bamboo as like a, a, a Chinese aesthetic. Um, bamboo on frames automatically meant it was Asian. Um, bamboo drawings on clothing, the patterns, it is deeply associated with Asian aesthetics. Uh, I was also going to the grocery store and even Ikea and seeing um, the lucky feng shui bamboo everywhere. And it was almost like rolled out, at, like when one store had it, every store had it. And researching about that um, lucky bamboo that grows in water, it, especially the ones that would twist and curl around things, learning that it takes over a year for that twist and curl bamboo to be forced to grow around these things that it's um, often sold in Asian markets or with the idea that this is a lucky object. But learning that that bamboo is um, cultivated and grown in Africa and exported to China for um, Chinatowns. And I thought that was really fascinating to learn that something we associate with Chinese culture, Asian culture, isn't even from China. And I was thinking too of the, what was going on in the world, how as women we haven't over, overcome more, that we're still living in a culture that's deeply rooted in misogyny and the patriarchy, that this bamboo is a metaphor for women, that bamboo um, is almost considered um, a weed or an invasive plant, that wherever we're plopped, wherever we go, we're able to evade, and that we can twist and curl and swerve and move around um, the patriarchy. And so this is a performance piece where I like inserted my body into this really thick bamboo thicket 
and that um, I was trying to manipulate my body and twist and curl my arm around the bamboo to see how I can flex and give and swerve in this situation. It's really hard to do. I thought I was pretty flexible and um, I learned that's not true, but I'm interested in how I can get my body to manipulate around these forms and that it rests on these um, terracotta blocks. These blocks are, um, I think they're funny in that they're, um, I think they're hipster planters. I see them all the time, but they're actually the foundation building blocks for chimneys. And so there's a play here of like the terracotta, which is from the earth, the porcelain, which we often associate with like um, purity and whiteness and desire. Um, resting on this piece too, this overall installation piece is um, a figurine that I purchased off of eBay. I am interested in this history of ceramics that um, was is kind of considered and rooted in, in objects of kitsch where they were funny, um, but they're really also deeply racist and misogynist too when we look at them through today's lens. That it's a planter with um, a woman wearing the rice picker hat, a cheng song with bamboo on it, and inserted into um, this holder are porcelain and bamboo stocks that um, I sculpted in um, porcelain and that they are twisting and curling. So thinking to a lot of the metaphors of twist and curl, how throughout my practice too, I work with porcelain, I work with human hair. So all the words and language that are like deeply embedded in my practice. And um, yeah, I look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for all of those good thoughts. <laughs> um, and I will now turn it over to Tamika. Um, and I will also paste Tamika's written bio into the chat as well. Um, but I think she will be able to speak towards her work really, really well without needing the bio. <laughs> um, um. Thank you. Well, thank you to Erica and Photo Relevance for hosting the exhibition and for this evening's talk. Um, Jennifer, I have so much to reply to you on your work um, right now, but uh, I'm going to switch directions. I really admire um, kind of the sense of humor in your work. And so I feel like this is a little bit of a left turn. Um, I'm going to start. So I'm going to talk about Hatsubone, which is what is um, on exhibit at Photo Relevance. And Jennifer, if you want to move, I'm sorry, um, Erica, to the first slide. Um, I'm going to just talk about the work as a whole, and I have a little bit of written script I'm just going to walk us through. Um, the whole work is a memorial to my father, and a lot of it, a lot of it's guided by an end-of-life experience, the conversation I had with him, um, of which I wrote a letter, so I want to read you an excerpt from the letter. I have been thinking for a long time about how to tell this story. People don't want to die. It is hard to be there when someone you love is dying. But I would not dream of being anywhere else. I remember it was only a few days before your last one with us, although we could not have known it then. We were together, you in the bed thinking, and me in a chair dozing. You asked me, what are we going to do with our things? I said, I don't think we need to do anything. We can leave them right here. Then you asked me, how are we going to get there? I will never forget this moment trying to imagine what you were seeing when you said there. I knew you were talking about a place outside of this visible world, some place on the other side of the thin veil that separates us, the living, from the rest of the unseen and unknown world. How are we going to get there, I asked? Yes. I guess we can travel however we want, I said, and began to list the usual ways. You looked at me and asked, how would you go? Well, you know me, Dad. I love boats. I would go by boat. You smiled and said, that sounds good. You eventually fell asleep and I settled down on the couch for the night. Bring me the oar, you called out. I woke suddenly, leaping from the couch. Your eyes were open and you were looking upwards. I came to the bedside. I knew what you were asking for. I laid my hand on your arm and your eyes closed and you returned to sleep or to whatever world you already had one foot in. I have thought every day of this since you've been gone, of you calling out, bring me the oar. I think about how I should make you one and how I would like to make you a boat too. We can go to the next slide. 
Hatsubon is a memorial for my father and evokes rituals from a cultural tradition. The story of the Or guided me to make this work. This work explores the dynamic tension between tradition and performance through photographs and objects and rests in the diaphanous space between life and death. The materiality of the work suggests the dualities of the fleeting and the lasting, the ephemeral and the corporeal, and the pendulous state between longing and release. So Hatsubun, it's a, um, it's a ritual celebration of the first anniversary of the death of a loved one, and it occurs during Obon, which is the time of year in the Japanese Buddhist calendar, when the thin veil between the living and the dead is rendered permeable when our loved ones return to visit us. We welcome them with gifts of food, illuminate the darkening hours with paper lanterns, and give thanks for the ancestors whose lives made our own possible. A ritual for the deceased is the sending of a small vessel. I would like to make a boat for dad, I said to my mom and my sister, and send it to sea. They agreed, and then I said, I would like to make some pictures too. And of course, as a photographer, that was no surprise to them. My sister and I sewed yukata, which are these simple kimonos, uh, cotton kimonos pictured here. And on the dawn of his Hatsubon, the three of us sent the boat to sea from the shores of Hawaii in his honor. I think of this work um, very much as a family collaboration. So next slide. Hatsubon visits three geographic sites of significance. Pennsylvania, my father's birthplace. Hawaii, my mother's birthplace and where my father is buried and California where my parents met and where I was born. So in the last image, we were in Hawaii and here on the other side of the Pacific on the California coast. I saw in the landscape a sense of departure and return where the river runs to the sea in its ever cycling nature. So next slide. So just a little bit on being guided. This was uh, um, my father's urn, which was uh, made a commission by a woodworker. And we talked a lot about design and just mimicking some of the kind of aesthetic of Japanese design, especially in the um, temple roof design. So just a few we weeks before we were going to Hawaii to bury my father and attend Obon, I was scheduled to go to Pennsylvania for a site visit to meet with curator Chris, Chris McGinnis. Um, this was in um, near Pittsburgh. So there were very few childhood stories that my father told, but he used to talk about playing on this river when he was a child. So I asked Chris, can you take me to this town? And, you know, as luck would have it, he actually lived in this town. So I, um, I brought the urn to the river and just a sort of like ritual of return and, uh, and photographed it. So this is the, the vessel of his urn along the Monongahela River in Swiss Bell, Pennsylvania. So overall, my practice engages the landscape in familial cultural memorial works. Um, and in these and others, I photograph prim primarily with a four by five field camera. I'm sure that question will come up. Um, and I almost always use my body as kind of a vessel. And, and also it's interesting here, Jennifer talk about her work, but I really use it as a stand in for the human subject. That is actually my five minute presentation. Thank you. Um, that was a big turn from humor to, to move into that work. I think I use humor to cover up all the sadness. Um. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Tamika, and thank you to both of you um, for sharing a little bit about your work. Um, I think where I might like to start, um, and also as a reminder to participants, you're welcome to ask anything that comes to mind. Um, but I think I might like to start at this place of thinking about how the two of you are working at this intersection of combining elements of Asian tradition with sort of a more contemporary like American aesthetic and you can fight me on like the me calling it an American aesthetic because I'm not even sure what that necessarily means um but I think I might be curious to know how you two are kind of navigating those two worlds, because I think they're coming out of a place of love for both of those two worlds too, at the same time, even if it, there's tension that comes about because of it. Um, and yeah, so I was just hoping you can give some language to that to start. Um, I might start because actually I wanted to comment about the bamboo. Um, 
I think that when there are so many materials that are really almost stereotypically associated with Asian culture, um, but there's also something really familiar about them too. And I don't know if you feel this, Jennifer, but I think a lot about, like Erica had asked us a question about, um, about similar to this in our interviews. And I thought about how growing up, you'd see certain objects that were like highly revered or they were just kind of important. And they were usually made with bamboo, beautiful, some kind of beautiful Asian Japanese, like his paper um, or porcelain, right? So there's like these very like um, important materials. And uh, so I think when it comes to choosing the material I want to work with, that's pretty much how I'm guided. And actually the vessel I made from my father was made with bamboo um, that I sliced and bent and then co um, covered it in paper. So that was a paper boat. And then in the work, um, in the installation aspect of the work, I also had the cast porcelain boat. So it's very interesting to think about our works together and how we engage those materiality. Um, I'm, I'm part of it's the kind of tactile nature and also of course the symbolic associations. But I think a lot of it has to do for me with familiarity. I, I think part like kind of the central question in my practice is kind of like, what does it mean to be American? And I think everyone is trying to figure out how to, what, how to define that and like what that means, especially in the United States where we, we kind of say we're a melting pot, but that we're definitely a melting pot that doesn't include everyone and everyone's story or perspectives in a lot of things. Um, I tell this story a lot is that we had a China cabinet growing up and I feel like China cabinets are very American in that you use it to present like your really beautiful like um, 10 to 12 dining set that you never use you, or you only use it for special occasions. But ours was filled with like Buddhas and special plates on display or vases with like peacocks on them. And I was taught to revere these objects but like I opened the cabinet one day and one of those plates was plastic. It was like a reproduction of something that was supposed to be special. Uh, so like I, there's all these like collisions in that is like, and two as someone who's growing up biracial or like a third culture kid where I'm, I'm too white to, for my Chinese family, too Chinese for my white family, but I exist in this third space that is like unique to itself that I think about that in like what I'm, I'm researching because I often wonder like, what am I allowed to claim or own when um, I've been so often told like, I can't do that by both sides. And you're just trying to find um, things where you feel like you belong. And like, you just wanna be able to tell your story. So like the bamboo for me was, I just wanted to research why I kept seeing like bamboo everywhere or certain times of the year and um, it was interesting too to have people ask me about it because they're like, oh, this is Chinese, she's Chinese. So it, all these things were entryways into conversations and then the research allowed me to research, um, learn more about them and then um, it plants the seed for me to start making. Thank you for that. And I, I'm sitting here looking at my own lucky bamboo that's sitting in the corner because I think I bought it because, you know, it's, I associated it with home and I associated it with growing up and it was just like this weird comfort symbol for me um even though like you were saying Jennifer it's not actually natively Asian um did, did you have one growing up we had them growing up every once in a while but it never lasted very long so then I think like that was we always had bad luck um <laughs> I have one I have a few around the house but I panicked when I didn't have eight. I had like seven. <laughs> so like those things kind of creep in where I'm like, oh yeah, I really am Chinese. Like I can't live with four. I have to live with eight. Like I panic about like numbers and things and how I directly relate that to like my life. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I grew up on <laughs> my address is the number four. Um, or at least my childhood home like starts with the number four and that was very much a thing we thought about at times and made fun of at times. Um, can I ask both of you to speak a little bit more towards like the materiality in your works and I think Tamiko you started touching upon it and if you would like me to pull me pull up slides I'm happy to do that. Um, but just sort of 
I think one of the things that visitors have really loved when they come and see your works in the gallery is this tactile energy that they have. Tomiko, I think your silks, like when they blow in our air conditioning, people find themselves very <laughs> drawn to them. Um, and Jennifer, I think people like see your knuckle rings, like the images of your knuckle rings. And at least this thought has crossed my mind of like, wow, what would happen if I punched somebody with that? Like what kind of imprint would that leave? Um, and so, you know, I think both of you are kind of expanding our notion of what like we normally think of as photography, um, which is, you know, the bread and butter of the gallery. And you are kind of transforming it through these materials that feel really intentional and purposeful and they come loaded with all of this symbolism and meaning. Um, all of that to say, will you speak a little more towards the materiality in your works? Yeah. Do you want to start, Jennifer? Oh, you go. No, you go. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to respond a little bit to the um, to what Jennifer was saying about the kind of I identity of American and being in mm -hmm. that um, third space. I think because I was really close to my mom's side of that we spent most of the time with my mom's side of the family, um, but my sister and I were the only like mixed kids in our um, generation primarily. Um, so there was a little bit of that too, right? So like things that like, well, can I claim this or can I not claim that? And I think even as, as a child, when I, when I was a lot younger, like in elementary school, we lived in Eastern Washington and um, it was very um, homogenous. And so I really kind of clung to those things because it didn't seem like I was ever going to fit in anyway. And so I think I clung to those things that be, had become part of my material culture or part of my, also my material practice. Um, at the same time, I've had to really check myself not to overdo it. So you're like, okay, I have silk, I have bamboo, I have kozo paper, um, right? I'm hand carving cherry wood, like, you know, all these things, um, these kind of um, markers, I suppose, of the cultural tradition um, become there. And how are those any more important than, like I was talking about the boat, right, that we sent for my father. And earlier, before we had this call, I was talking about how, like, the elders now, because of... Um, no one makes the boat anymore and they're, it's hard for them to walk down to the sea. They burn these um, strips of paper, which also has a tradition. But I remember one year, Mr. Naito was writing with a ballpoint pen, you know, on like a college ruled paper. And I was like, oh, how can he do that? So that's so American, right? Ballpoint pen, paper. But the, but the meaning of it, like the tradition, the actual act of like writing the name down and then burning the paper, like that maintains its meaning, its significance. And so just thinking about how ritual in relation to material um, changes, it becomes contemporary, right? It doesn't make it less significant. So I know I just got a little bit off subject, um, but I think that I, I really carefully think about everything that I use and I have sometimes felt like, oh, I should pull back a little or think about how to incorporate things that can be representative of, um, of what the work's about. So with Hotsabone, because it was so much about the memorial I use a lot of the materials that I often use, but I also chose to use ash, which is considered the tree of life in the Gaelic tradition to make the actual skeleton boat for my father because he's a Jones. So he was the, the white side of the family. And so, but all, all the tradition around sending him away was coming from my mother's side of the family. So I wanted to have those kind of representations as well. And then of course, like inviting the landscape into the work as, as representative of place and the sites of significance. Well, Tamiko, I love that you print your images onto silk because I often think of like the power of materials and that they're tiny but mighty. So like mm. silk is so like luxurious and like seems really fragile and it, but it comes from like this mighty little like silkworm. And I think about that with porcelain is like we often associate with really dainty, delicate things like teacups or precious things that get locked behind cabinets, but mm -hmm. it's really quite resilient. Like when it's broken, it's such a vitrified tight material that um, it's almost like glass, but also our toilets are made from porcelain. So like, honestly, porcelain must have like the best marketing team because like it is um, a really durable, hardy material. And I think, um, I use that a lot in my practice. And I think that's also a metaphor for like how women are perceived. I think um, the stereotypes of Asian women and how we're like dragon ladies or we're really demure. Like I look at the dualities associated with materials and that's one reason why like I'm attracted to like the material porcelain. 
but that's also a, a material that's a cultural connector for me that in some ways hair has become that for me too and that like researching the human hair industry and how so much of it is rooted in Asia to like manufacture wigs of different culture and ethnic styles. So I, I feel like in some ways I am learning how like there's Asian-ness in everything. Um, but like those things get lost in like history. Um, you know, I start like first and foremost, I'm a sculptor, like photography came like maybe second or third in my practice, but for a way it was really for me to like perform identity to like document it and capture it. And um, I, I also say like, I'm definitely influenced by like social media and how Instagram and images are shared and like um, posted. And I wanted to use that in my practice to kind of show that like something this dainty is also very powerful. Mm -hmm. Right, and silk in the same way is also a powerful material because it's really strong and it also breathes. So it can also be an insulator and it can also be cooling, right? So it's also used for like warm, to keep you warm, but then it's also worn in very hot weather. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's that, there's that as well. Um, there's something about the bamboo too. There's a wonderful saying, I think it's actually from the Tao Te Ching about, and maybe this could relate to femininity, about when the wind is strong, the bamboo bends, but it never breaks. Oh. <laughs> I, perfect metaphor for women. Um, surviving during this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, sorry, I am processing. Um, I also, I think, and Jennifer, I think I've heard you bring this up in talks in the past too. I, I, well, first of all, I think every time you bring up the fact that your toilet is porcelain, it kind of gets me because it indeed is porcelain. Um, <laughs> And I also love this thread of like how there's like a little bit of Asianness in a lot of things that we use because like these materials are so ubiquitous and we look to them and turn to them as symbols of Asian culture, but they pop up everywhere. And I think that ties in really nicely to thinking about how some like how these things have crossed global networks and have appeared in all of these different parts of the world. And yet somehow we also find ourselves and maybe this is an American idea, but I think it's a little more ubiquitous in the world too of that things made in Asia are somehow lesser than, or they're like of poor mm -hmm. quality. And I, but then I look at your works, like both of your works and I sit there and I think like, no, no, no. Like, how can this possibly be? Like they're beautiful and they're stunning. And I think the reason why they exist everywhere in the world is because people coveted these items and they wanted a part of it for their own households. Um, Oh, for sure. I think I've been making work recently about this idea of made in China and that um, it is often like equated with things that are cheaper or less than, but so many things made in China are what we use to live and they make our lives more comfortable and easy every day. Like when you buy something on Amazon and how quick it comes, like it's because these objects are made so quickly and cheaply in other places and how I often wonder why the labor of yellow bodies is often, why is it not considered equal or same as the labor of American bodies, whatever that American bodies means. But um, yeah, it's like so much bigger in how we are deeply rooted in capitalism and that like capitalism has been um, perpetuating this um, global inequality for as long as like it has been alive. Um, yeah, so there is like also that like duality, that extreme um, in this. I just wanted to um, respond to something you said earlier, um, which sorry, is going back just a little bit about how there's all this performance in your work. Um, and it made me think about the objects. And so I feel like my work is quite performative as well. Um, although I, I feel like we're like coming at it from different positions, but we kind of end up with similar, we end up with like a photographic record of whatever it is that happened. So for me starting, I don't wanna say starting, but I work you know, primarily for, through a photographic lens, although I've always loved the making things. Um, actually, I used to really love fixing things when I was a kid. So like the, th the part about using my hands and so all the objects that show up in my work for, I don't know, ever, I don't wanna say forever, say like 20 years of practice, 
I almost always make them. So I actually could probably go and order something. Yeah. But I want to go through all this labor to make it, and then it's all out of focus anyway, right? Or it's going to go like, you know, I make it uh, all eco so that it can go drown in the ocean and we'll never see it again. And I have like one picture and that's it. So, but there's something about the labor of it, right? There's something about the making of it. So even though it ends up in the photographic record, it is its kind of final resting spot, except for sometimes I show them as sculptures occasionally. Um, so I, I think I like that idea of how we came come to that. Yeah, I love too that you make these objects because I think it speaks to like the authenticity of the experience and the story and what you're trying to capture. And um, I think that's for the reason why I like, I always use my body in these because um, it has to be from like my perspective of being like third culture and half and biracial and like other, um, that has to be my body performing these. I, I don't think I can ask someone else to do it. It wouldn't be authentic. Yeah, and I want, I think I want to pick up actually on this thread of the performative nature of both of your works. Um, just because I think I've been thinking a lot maybe with this show about how, you know, Asian American narratives or, you know, diasporic narratives don't necessarily have the same kind of like written canonical records that we're used to having. And so I love that kind of both of your works serve as this like their own versions of record keeping um, and kind of tapping into those histories. And I, I guess I'm curious to know what is it like sort of cultivating and working from these spaces of vulnerability in which you're kind of putting forth these really personal narratives and transforming them into pieces that people then witness and experience. And what drives you to ultimately be so generous with your stories? I really, I think, I think I was culturally um, trained to not like express or share emotions. I think I was supposed to be a very dutiful Chinese daughter and just like put my head down and do things. And I think as an adult, I'm unpacking all of that and realizing that there's a lot of strength and vulnerability and that we all just want like human connections and to um, be related to and like have be heard. So for me, like part of my making is that I didn't see my stories like mine reflective in like the art I was taught or seeing. So it's like why I make the work I make. The performance part, I always had these ideas for it, but it took me a long time to feel comfortable inserting myself in that because then it becomes like more real. Um, that I would say every time I do something, I do like get sick and I like my stomach hurts and I it's like, and I then have to like kind of step back from it and like, like question like what is the entry point for the viewer for this piece that um, maybe there's something to this that like if I'm deeply uncomfortable that there is something here that needs to be said that I'm trying to express and share. Um, yeah, I often think now like I don't know if I can keep doing it. It's like too much for me sometimes. Uh, I think uh, I, was, I am pretty shy, but I'm also a classic I'm born in the year of the monkey is that like when it's time to shine, I can do it, but then I'm going to crawl into a deep dark hole after this. Um, so like these are all the things I think about with like in many ways I've been told I've been performing identity my whole life that There's some comfort in existing in that space, but I, I want to figure out a way to make it relatable relatable. Yeah, performing identity, that's interesting. I mean, I feel like that there's probably a lot of performance for me, but I don't know if it's always been particularly related to identity. I, of course it is. <laughs> I'm always like, when, it isn't, when isn't it not about identity yeah, right? or gender? Sure. Of course it always is, but um, I feel like there might have been for me this element of um, maybe I thought I was performing humanity, and so like allowing myself to be a stand in for that or femininity. Um, in some earlier works. So I feel like, and I know I've been very conscious of this for a long time, is that I feel like I was getting smaller and smaller and smaller in my work as actually being seen in it. 
um, which is great that the title of this work is Now You See Me. Uh, I mean, the title of the exhibition. So that I was always trying to like kind of minimize, like it's not about me, it's not about me. Like I'm just like standing in for these things and I'm the only person who can really do it because of the way that I work or because I don't feel like I can transmit an idea to someone and then have them perform it for me. And I don't know if that has something to do with labor also. It could be, it could also have something to do with privacy. Um, but with Hatsubon, I couldn't get away from that. That work is totally about me and my family, right? And it's about, of course, it's about cultural tradition. It's about generational knowledge. It's about all these other things. It's about um, loss and death and grief and all these things. But, I, but it was so clearly us. And so there was this moment of permission with my mother and my sister and my father in some ways who had already passed um, and my family too, like my larger family about the vulnerability about making your own loss so public and asking my family to be part of a ritual that was gonna be photographed and then seen by other people. Um, and it took a huge amount of I guess I'm just going to say courage. I was terrified. And I know I mentioned this to Erica in my interview. I was really scared to show the work. I mean, when I made it, I thought, well, it's fine. I'm just going to show one picture anyway, because I'm such a minimalist. Um, and, a la and, and asking my family to participate in it, but it ended up being like an incredibly beautiful experience. And I had to not hide behind like research and theory. And I found that extremely liberating and terrifying at the same time. And I feel like it's really changed my practice. How did your family respond to being in the work? It'd be really funny if they were here now. Maybe they could <laughs> say something. <laughs> um, I think they all knew me so well that it, it wasn't a surprise that I would ask. And then when my, both my mother and sister saw the, have seen various versions of Hatsubone, um, separately. I don't know if they feel like it's an honor is quite the right word, but they seem very comfortable with it. And the other thing was when my father passed away, um, like right after he actually took his final breath, my, my mother had said, um, um, you can take your picture now. And I'll mm -hmm. never forget that because I was like, what picture? I wasn't planning on taking a picture. Her and her and my sister started moving things out of the picture. They knew I wouldn't like, like, a plastic cup, right? Because I'm like, I don't like plastic. I want to be a glass or something, right? Because of my, <laughs> because of my attention to materials, and um, and so I instinctively actually reached for my um, Rolleiflex, which had some slow speed film in it, which made it really difficult. And I didn't even back myself up digitally, but I because it was this like it was such an emotional moment, and I took a, a photograph of uh, actually quite a few photographs of him in that mm -hmm. moment. So it felt like there was this permission, I guess, given by my family. Um, yeah. yeah. Miko, is it okay if I pull up those images you added to the slides just so people sure. can see yeah. like the installation element? Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through it a little bit too? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's crazy. <laughs> I was thinking, I was still thinking about the question. Um, so this image here, that actually is the ore. So after that story that I read to you, that I, I can't even remember the order of things exactly, but I actually was at a residency for a year and I was working on um, around watershed in the Bay Area and looking at the twin crises of drought and um, sea level rise. So I was really working on environmental and ecological themes, which is also a big current in my work. Um, and it became clear over time that I wasn't actually making work about ecology. I was making work about grief. And there was this moment that it, there was permission given, um, mostly in conversation with Deirdre Visser, who is um, the curator I worked with on that exhibition. and. The ore, so this ore itself, so we talk about the, the, the labor of making, like there was something so cathartic as hand carved, so it was so slow, and I actually really love slow repetitive work, I'm, I'm a kind of a slow maker, um, and so that, that was like one of the first um, 
I guess I feel like it's the object that kind of guided the work. It was one of the last things actually to be finished, but it was one of the first things to come. Um, so these are the um, images printed on silk and they are kind of representative of the stages of um, the release. And then there are some images that are framed like the one on the far wall. And those ones I thought to be, I get, Actually, much like the body, like heavy, they're framed in heavy walnut um, and kind of be representative of that physicality that we take up in the space when we're like in our bodies. And then the, the silk ones to have that, like when you mentioned how they move in the wind, to have that kind of diaphanous sense of um, neither here nor there to be in that transitional space. And they're pretty large, I guess, about four by five feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 52 inches by 65, mm -hmm. I think exactly. Uh, and I tested out a lot of different materials. I love printing on fabric and I've done another project on fabric, but it isn't always the right form, right? So, and it was completely the right choice for this work, I feel. Um, I mean, if we go into a critique, maybe you can ask me further, but it was one of those things I like, I love to use it, but it only works sometimes. Um, so on this wall here are some of the porcelain boats, the cast boats. Um, and I actually were, was making those for an outdoor installation earlier on, and they've kind of started to show up more and more throughout the work, but the, they're very much like the repet, repetition of shape. They're in the shape of the boat, which is also a repeating symbol throughout my work. And um, I had cast them one summer knowing that they needed to be made. And I actually, it's like one of the first times I've shown them has been in this work. So they kind of sat in boxes for a long time waiting for the right moment. And this is, um, so the video aspect of the work is, there's three sites um, all on water, because I'm still working through that in my other work and continue to actually to present day. Um, they were the Pacific Sea on the California side, on the Hawaii side, and then um, the water, the Monongahela River. And so they're three reflecting pools. So they're, in this case, they're actually being projected on the wall and they're reflected in um, shallow pools, <clears throat> excuse me, so a bit like the memorial, like a memorial pool, um, and then the moon shapes are reminiscent of many things, a recurring shape also in my work, but also there's a very famous, uh, very popular folk song, a Japanese folk song about, um, about watching the moon rise, and it was actually like my grandfather's favorite song, so I feel like there's also this, there's a little bit of a, um, a kind of nod to that, that familial tradition. And, and then, of course, the repetition of three being very much the the three geographic sites, and then the three women in his in my father's life. So it's this memorial coming from the three of us, being the ones who kind of held him. Three women, actually. Yeah. Thank you for walking us through that. <laughs> um, I. Well, let's turn to this question really quickly. Um, so Bryn is asking, what are each of you working on next? Um, I'm in like the research planning phase of new work and I'm looking at um, this one Chinese propaganda poster from the 60s that translates into um, later, longer, fewer and it's about um, birth control and just thinking about like birth control as a form of like um, allowing women more equitable opportunities and like some control over their reproduction but in China's case it was like to control population and thinking about the the um, conversations and debate and argument about um, birth control in this country so um, porcelain objects I have ideas for like a new performance piece but I'm still working it all out in my head and I'm kind of thankful to have like a pause um, during this time to like let ideas marinate and make new work. Um, wow, I wonder if I can give a short sound bite. I should be very good at this by now. Uh, I've been working for a number of years very loosely on this public land project. A lot of my work has to do with place in the landscape. Um, when the outgoing administration <clears throat> Uh, first came in, they, you know, changed a lot of things very quickly, including some of the um, things that you're talking about in your current work. And uh, I 
was living in a place where I was living very close to one of the sites under review by the Department of the Interior. So the whole kind of EPA, the Department of the Interior, and then reviewing these public land sites to be um, to be reviewed for redistribution, pr primarily for private sales for timber extraction and other kinds of ways um, we might um, abuse our environment. And so many of these places are really close to home. So I wanted to go to these sites and not just go run out and kind of do that lost narrative photography, um, but just really see like who's there, what's what's their stake in being there, and like really looking at the kind of vast um, vastness of people who use and appreciate the land. Um, so really trying to look at stakeholders in the space in a way that's not um, necessarily with an agenda, because certainly I have my own. Um, knowing that I needed to spend more time in each site, and as well, I was making a lot, I've been making a lot of um, kind of instant prints with cyanotypes um, and block prints and imprinting objects. And um, so wanting to engage that, which as well as like have the social engagement with people who are there which I feel like is kind of a natural part of my practice. I, I will say, someone will say one thing to me and I feel like I can make an entire body of work around it. I mean, I feel like I have this like ongoing list. And so some of this, the, this project in some ways is related to that because if someone tells me a story or about a place or why they like this place, I'll go there and find out. And I think there's a little bit of, um, I take a little bit of that from Sophie Keller. Or maybe that's why I love her so much. When someone goes, you need to go to Fortune Teller and then she does and then went, Right, so on. Uh, but maybe a little more geared towards kind of environmental concerns. So I'm actually headed out um, this spring in a mobile studio. It's a little travel trailer um, that I can work out of and I'm going to be spending more time on site and I'm really excited um, and also feel like it's a really intense moment um, to be out talking with people. We're in a pandemic. People are really polarized um, and there's been quite a bit of hostility I think as well and I don't know if the two of you felt it, but during the um, earlier part of the summer when there was a lot of racial tension and quite a bit of Asian hating going on, um, that made the, the outdoor space where everyone is flocking to feel maybe not quite as, as comforting as I've found it in the past. Mm. No, for sure. I think it's, I think the only space we feel safe it and hopefully we feel safe it is inside our own home but knowing that that also has been a precarious situation for many um, I know I was definitely worried and concerned every time I went out but I also feel like I can pass it was more mm -hmm. like for my husband who um, I witnessed like the worst things said to him and you know it's hard for me to hold me back like I'm going to rip someone apart um, yeah yeah, and I think, especially now, it's almost just the anticipation of hurtful things or just like kind of yeah. being made to feel unwelcome. It, like it doesn't even have to be the actual action of it, right? It's just the thinking of that this right. could happen and just like assuming that it might happen and looking around and making sure that you're out of like the zone of where it could happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I, well, I think I might commandeer this to ask one more final question then. Yeah. Um, because thinking about how both of your practice are really rooted in, to make up your phrase, was socially engaged, but sort of like this socially engaged activist sentiment, um, where Jennifer, I think a lot of your work is really kind of tapping into this notion of being othered and kind of reaching out a hand to people who have also felt othered and sort of saying like, hey, like you're not alone. Like I felt this thing too. Um, and it's important that we talk about it. And then Tamiko, your work is centered around the environment, which is like kind of degrading as we speak. Um, and I guess I'm kind of wondering, and maybe this is not a fair question because I feel like we have been turning to our artists a lot for inspiration and hope, um, but I'm wondering how you are sustaining that kind of momentum in tackling issues that kind of feel like you are just, you know, like climbing up a hill constantly. Mm. Um, well, certainly dark times, um, yeah, climbing up the hill, but then I think there have been so many times in history that may have felt like this. So I just try to think about, our ancestors and the feminists before us and the people who've really struggled before us and to use that as a guide. Um, I also really 
I might be really naive, but I believe in unlikely allies, or some people might say uncomfortable bedfellows or whatever that term is. <laughs> I like that bedfellows, let's say unlikely allies. So that would be the idea of, um, like say in an activist tradition where the, um, you know, the union activist will stand side by side by the, um, the people protecting the turtles who are, you know, dressed up in some kind of crazy costume. That, that those unlikely allies, that comes from Rebecca Solman actually, those un the turtles and the teamsters, I think it's called the turtles, those unlikely allies in the power of that kind of union. So when we hear these speeches of like, oh, this is a time of healing for America, and we're like, oh, we'll see about that. But I'm like, actually, I wanna, I wanna see about that. I wanna believe that that's possible. Oh, for sure. I think I like we already are living in a pandemic where it's like driven the wedge between social equality and like equity, like so much further away. And then we have all the social injustice that it feels overwhelming. And I often think like not one person or one artist can change the world, but collectively we can. So that's kind of like the momentum or hope I hold on to. And, but I also know we're all exhausted and tired. And, um, you know, the, like I think too, we're at such important conversations and time where um, Asians are trying to figure out where they fit in in these this conversations of race and how we can be better allies. It's about dismantling the model minority myth. Like we also are so responsible for like educating our community and even our own family and our students and like, we all just have to try our best at this time. Um, I feel like that's definitely been like fueling momentum. But there were times during this where I was like, I don't really feel like making anything. I kind of really felt like, what's the point? And it took me a while to crawl out of that. Um, but we also need to give ourselves time to rest um, because like Tamiko said, like other generations have experienced this. We're still doing this. We're, we might still always have to do this. So like, how do we set good examples for our community? Yeah, and especially because you're also in education. So, mm -hmm. I mean, when I talk to, um, you know, some of the women who are voting for the first, who have voted for the first time, young women and men, but there's definitely some young women who've been expressing, um, being able to exercise this road, understanding, you know, the history of that right, not just with um, with women voting, but also that was a privilege extended to white women um, and the current Supreme Court and what that means to their body. And so I just, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I was thinking that same thing when I was your age. So, but then I wanna be like, we've also made some progress. And so I, I think like, I, I don't know, Erica, for answering the question, but we need rest, but also like the classrooms, like this amazing place where those conversations can happen and just the way that you insert uh, work in front of people and with that and just let them look at it. So, I mean, I think that's where the role of art becomes incredibly important, whether it's, um, whether it's like showing us the history or it's asking us those questions mm -hmm. um, and then how we can just sort of like a little protein powder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I think that was very encouraging for me too. I think I saw I think the question was a little bit selfish because I also really wanted to <laughs> get advice on kind of keeping going when everything kind of feels like very fraught and very difficult. Um, but I think this might be a good place to end. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> um, but thank you both so much for participating in the show and for making yourselves available for like an online talk. I think in different circumstances, we would have everyone together in the gallery to do this physically. Um, but I think it has been really good to be able to connect regardless um, to the audience. I'm going to actually drop the link to the viewing room there really quickly if you'd like to take a final peek at the show before it comes down. Um, but otherwise, thank you both so much. Oh, thank you, Erica, for the amazing questions. I know Tamiko and I were both nervous because mm -hmm. we didn't know what they were, but I I love like you, how your introspections of our work and our practice, and thank you for putting us together. I think it was so lovely to talk with you. I echo that sentiment completely, and I loved it that I felt like when we showed up, we looked a little like twins in <laughs> shapes. <Yes. laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to the audience that we can't see. I know it's been Zoom after Zoom. And thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight.
Yeah, thank you.